So back in the day, some of you might remember this back in the day, when you were going to take a trip, you went to the bookstore and you got a book about that place you were going. Does anybody remember back in the day? Yeah, I mean, I've still seen these books like Japan in 20 days and, you know, travel books. They're pretty cool because you could read them before you were taking your trip and you could get a sense of where you were going and it could fill you with anticipation, help you pack your bags, really equip you for the trip you were about to go on. The Bible is like that. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but the Bible is, in a sense, a guidebook to a land of God's fullness and presence. It's not entirely like that. There's stuff in there that you're like, I don't know how that works with that definition. But the overall scope and inspiration of scriptures is exactly that. It is a guidebook into the presence, incarnation, dwelling, and way of living in this world inspired by the kingdom of God. Our collect this morning invites us to think about the Bible that way. It says that all scriptures were given to us by God for our learning about God about God's presence, about God's purposes, and about how our lives intersect with that. When we listen to Matthew 25, we have three servants, and they're given a treasure. I've never done this before, but this week I've been thinking about Matthew 25 in terms of scripture. What does it mean that I have been given and you have been given a book that tells us all about the nature and purposes and presence of God? What are we doing with it? Is it on a shelf? Have we buried it? Is it collecting dust? Or are we investing? I'd say like that first person in the parable Maybe they have a PhD in scriptural studies, so they're like really deep diving into the scripture and they're getting really a lot of payoff. I know that for myself, the preparation for the time that I have with you is a time that really makes me dig into the Bible. And every single time that I do that, I come away so much richer. It's an incredible book. It is amazing all the ways in which you can spend time and more and more comes out. But it's also a book that's a guide. It doesn't have to be that we have some degree or some vocation or some anointing in order to read the Bible and find the riches that are in it. So I want to think with you this morning about that because for one thing, the Bible is inspired, it is the word of God, but it also is a way of relating to God, right? And relating to the people that came before in their story. So it's history, it's poetry, it's letters, it's the sayings of Jesus, all for us to look into. If you've seen the movies, the Harry Potter movies, there's this book of monsters, and every time you open it, it's like all the monsters come out. There are a lot of stories and movies like that where a book has this magical potential. And to me, as a Christian, I think sacred scriptures are really what that's pointing to. But you know, if you're like me, sometimes that book can sit there for too long. Sometimes it can feel like, yeah, I just heard like epic amounts of scripture right there. Do I really need to engage the Bible again the rest of the week? You do. You can. And you'll find that it's rich in a voice that will listen and speak to your spirit. So the prayer that we prayed invites us to read or hear, to mark, to learn, and inwardly digest. Let's eat our book, basically, right? We're going to eat our scriptures and let them become a part of us. This is faithful to our sacramental understanding of life, that these tangible things carry within them a spiritual nourishment and that we can therefore be transformed through them that's our scriptures so think about that that text that we heard the first one that one isn't in our lectionary how many people have heard that story before have you heard it before where you kneel down and drink from the water the the two the way that god sort of sorted the army out 
It's a really great story. And if you just read it, and you read it all the way through, you find out that God called Gideon to call a whole army up. 32,000 people came. And then God just winnowed that army down to 300. And then God gave the victory in the middle of the night. And all they had to do is run down a hill with some jars full of light. And everybody was so spooked about the Israelites that they just ran. They were scared to death. And the victory was won. God won the victory. All you have to do is read the story and you can say, man, there is 32,000 things laying on top of me. And I don't know if I'm going to make it. God will give the victory. Whatever that victory looks like, I don't have to win it. God can win it. Read it. You can mark the scriptures. You can start looking at it and say, did you notice how he is winnowing wheat in a wine press? That's a pretty funny imagery. I think of I Love Lucy when she's like in the wine press and she's, and I think, okay, this dude is in a wine press, which looks like kind of like a hot tub, and he's doing something so nobody notices because he doesn't want the enemy to come and tax him or take his, his seeds away. That's a pretty funny image. I'm sure when people read that originally, they were like, ha, that's really funny. And did you notice if you're marking it that he is told you are a mighty warrior and he responds, us, us. This guy thinks us. He doesn't think me. He doesn't say, oh God, I can't be a mighty warrior. He says us. He thinks in the we. It's kind of interesting. What does that mean? When do I hear a call about me and forget to think about us? Marking the scripture, thinking about those little things. And oh my goodness, you guys, we are so blessed because we have the internet that can go, you can Google anything and learn so much about any of these texts. Does anybody do that when you're reading your scripture? Mmm, go for it. It's amazing. And there are many voices out there and some of them are gonna tell you cuckoo stuff and some of them are gonna tell you rich, deep, meaningful stuff. The Holy Spirit is your guide, don't worry about it. Read, learn, take counsel. It's really interesting. On that note, the weirdness of 300 people laying on their stomach lapping water. Really? People did that? Isn't that interesting? So there are all these thousands of people, 300 did it. I love that. I love that because when I put that up against Matthew 25 with the one person that had the one talent, or the, or the ways in which we tend to elevate some people with lots of talents and some people that don't use their... Here's 300 people who are doing something that seems really odd, and yet God uses it, right? They're not conforming to the expectation. But then I read this midrash that said, at that time, the Israelites were worshiping other gods. They were worshiping the Baals. And to do the worship of the Baals, you knelt. So if you were an Israelite, you don't, kneeling's not a part of a Jewish way of expressing worship or prayer. They pray standing up or they, they bow like this. They don't kneel. Kneeling is, especially at this time. And so the Midrash, this is what I read from a rabbi, a rabbinical um, interpretation, is that those who laid down and lapped the water were those who had not worshipped the Baals because it wasn't a a posture they were used to. It's interesting. I don't know if it's true. I don't even know if the rabbis knew it was true. But it is a part of thinking about and enriching our understanding of the story. All of that to inwardly digest, to inwardly say, I am receiving a tradition, a narrative, a story. Sometimes it blows my mind. Sometimes it appalls me. But when the words of Jesus particularly speak into my life, I am changed. I receive those words, that story about the talents, about it means so much more than economics. It means what have I been given and how am I trusting God and how am I even thinking about God? Do I think of God as a big customs officer going through my moral suitcase? No. Your God, the God of Jesus, is saying, 
Come to me, all you who are labor. I love you. I welcome you. I want to partner with you so that you can partner with me in the abundance that's meant for everyone. That's the heart of Jesus' words. That's the resource we have in this amazing book. And as the prayer says, the more we, that we can embrace and hold fast to our place in God's eternal kingdom. There's a wonderful phrase that is in the Gospels where Jesus stood up in front of the Isaiah scroll. It's, I think it's both in Luke and Matthew, this story. It's early in Jesus' mission. He gets up and he stands before the scriptures and he says, he reads Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor, to set the captives free. Remember this text? Hopefully you've heard it before. If not, go find it. But the first thing before he starts to read, it says Jesus found his place in the text. He found his place in the text. And our invitation is to find our place in the text, to find where it speaks over our lives and invites us into partnership, into fullness and abundance, so that we can find our way through this crazy life and find our way through eternity, knowing that we are already moving because we've got the guidebook. It's not the only guidebook, but it's our guidebook. And we hold it fast and receive from it. Thanks be to God.